unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 8, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. He says, better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Why does the writer tell us better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof? Because it's easier to start something and harder to end it. There's a big question going out across the world, and I believe in all spheres of life where there are many people who have started many, many things in life. They've started businesses that have collapsed along the way, and they say, oh no, God spoke to us. And indeed, for some people, it's possible that actually God spoke. We have people who think, well, the only way something can fail is because God did not speak. But I beg to disagree. Sometimes there are other aspects in spite of the voice of God coming of instruction to do a thing. There are other aspects in this understanding, patterns that I believe that we have to follow and align ourselves to, even when God speaks. I have seen men who have failed even when God spoke. An example is Moses. God appears to Moses and tells him, take the children of Israel into the promised land. That was a mandate. That was an assignment. There was an instruction. Moses was supposed to take the children of Israel from Egypt through the wilderness into the promised land. But the Bible says that the children of Israel stir him to anger. And instead of speaking to a rock, he smites it. And God takes him up the mountain and tells him, you know what? You're going to see the promised land, but you're never going to go to the promised land. It does not mean that God had not called Moses to go to the promised land. It only means that there are people who misled him into doing contrary to what God had ordained him and instructed him to do. And hence, a man of God did not make it to the promised land, even though the voice of God, the instruction and grace was available to take Moses to the promised land. So it doesn't mean that all the people who have failed in life, it means or presupposes that In the first place, God had not instructed or called them. But like I say, that they are principles. They are things we consider. They are things we look into and learn. For you know the Bible says in Hosea 4, 6, that my people perish for a lack of knowledge. When the Bible says that people perish for a lack of knowledge, ultimately the question is as of whether we are available to God to apply ourselves to knowledge so we are free. For the Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Or we continue in ignorance and walk off the path and patterns of God. It's that simple. The essence of the word of God is to give subtlety to the simple. It's what brings light. The entrance of the word brings light. It's what illuminates us to show us the way and light our paths. And that is why we teach the word of God. Because the Bible says once it is sent into Jacob, it lights the whole of Israel. When a man is enlightened, when a man is standing in the glorious light of the gospel, that man is a success. That man will have results. And now we have issues of believers out there, people who have begun things that have failed or in the middle have failed or they began a great project. It had all, you know, projections well. It had all the plans well. Uh, Perhaps at the starting you even had the funds to begin it. It all looked like an upward spiral and then one day you wake up and you're not able to finish it. You start building, you know, a house and you're not able to finish it. There are ministers out there, preachers, pastors, who were heavily, and I mean heavily, called by God, and they began great ministries. And uh, while they even have strength in their bodies and all sorts of abilities and gifts available, the brooks are drying, you know, the ministries are failing already. And some of these things are not uh, even touching what, per se, uh, a man of God has done, maybe in character-wise or any other way, but something has failed. And if you were called by God and 
potential is frustrated in there because you're not seeing or you're not walking through what you believe you're supposed to be walking through in your hour and in your period and in your season there's something that happens to you when you are called of god and the list is endless some people went into education and invested themselves heavily into careers to pursue and things did not go through some of you have had journeys and committed to go certain places and have failed to go i could say one after another many many things sometimes we have the faith to begin these things but many of us do not know how to build a faith to keep the things that god has given us but as the bible says in ecclesiastes 7 verse 8 it says better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof in other words god is telling you and i that the end of a thing defines everything. It's important that you finish well. It's important that whatever you have in your life is done to the end. It's important that whatever the Lord has laid on your life to do, in your past to do, that by his grace you'll finish. And that's the essence. That's why tonight, even as I share, I believe that God is giving somebody divine power, divine strength to complete whatever he has placed upon you. It doesn't matter how big it is. Some people think that things fail because they're bigger. No, things don't fail because they're bigger. The Bible says with God, all things are possible. There is nothing impossible to whosoever believeth. You know, there are people who have done even way bigger than what you're believing God for. And there will always be men and women who will do bigger than what you have done. So the question is, how are they able to do what you have done and even more except that there is a power there is a force there are patterns there are principles that are aligned behind their success and these are the things we want to teach that you will never start anything and it fails on the way that you will never go on a quest to do something and it's not fulfilled to the latter god intends that even the end ought to be better than the beginning of a thing your end must be successful your end must be prosperous you must finish well jesus says in the gospel of john he says that this is the will of god he says this is my meat he says that I might do the will of God and finish it and accomplish it. This is Jesus. He says, this is my meat that I might do the will of him that sent me and to accomplish it. Why does he say that? Because God did not send Jesus to fail. Have you ever imagined if Jesus had come to the earth and failed to fulfill the mandate that God had ordained him to fulfill? How would the world have looked like if Jesus had not fulfilled the mandate God had sent him out to fulfill? The Bible says when Paul is speaking in his last days, he says that I have now ready to be offered up at the time of my departure is at hand. And he says, I have fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid upon for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at the day. And not only to me, but unto all of them that love is appearing. But I love how he says it. He says, I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Paul is trying to talk about something here. He's trying to talk about that strength, that faith that finishes, the faith that sees you through, the faith that prays through, the faith that believes through, the faith that performs through, the faith that does through. God wants or he has ordained us, he has called us to do things and finish them, to do things and finish them. And that is why Paul is trying to say here. That is why Jesus is trying to say here. In the book of Revelation, he's talking to the church. Revelation chapter 3 in the church in Sardis. And I wanted to read for you the English standard version. In verses 2, he says, Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in my sight. He says, Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in my sight or in the sight of God. This is God telling the church that they have to wake up and do whatever is necessary because their works are not complete. And wherever there is incompleteness, there remains feebleness. There remains weakness. There remains a sort of death. There are people who are surrounded by experiences that will never come to completion except they come to the knowledge of how things are completed. I know of a young man who believed God for a car. He constructed enough faith to believe God for a car. And... Uh, True to form, God gave him that car, and he started driving that car. And then I start to see him around the circles, always begging for fuel. He's begging for money to repair the car. He's begging for money to service the car. And in fact, after a while, this young man one time sold that car. He had to get rid of it because the expenses of that car were way bigger than he was able to run. Yet he had enough faith 
okay, to buy that car. Of course, the people would say, oh, by the time God gave you that car, uh, isn't it his responsibility to fuel that car? Well, how does he fuel it? The question is, how was he to maintain the car? Of course, God is the author and the finish of our faith. But why is it that when we begin things, when God works through us to begin great things, we don't have the power to finish them, to accomplish them, to get to the end of those things and have the full reward and result of the things God has given us? Oh, yes, it's true. They say that God will see it. But how? The question is how? The question is how? Okay? And I tell people that it's one thing to have faith to get a thing. It's another for the faith to sustain that thing. God works through faith from the beginning to the end. Some people think that they'll by faith receive things and keep them in unbelief, which is not possible. It's the fear that was in the heart and the spirit of Job. He has children, okay? God has given him the grace to have children. But he says, but the things that I greatly feared, he says, the things that I dreaded, he says, they've come upon me. He says, I was not silent. I was not quiet. In fact, the Amplified says, for the thing which I greatly fear, it comes upon me. And that of which I'm afraid of befalls me. This is Job speaking. He says, I was not or not at any ease, nor had I or had I rest, nor was I or am I quiet. Yet trouble came and still comes upon me. Why does Job find trouble coming upon him? Because he has a spirit of fear. We understand by scripture that actually Job is the one that broke the hedge of his life. Because even when he raised children, God had given him children. Praise him. But he did not have the faith to keep his children. We realize by scripture now and experience that actually Job opened the hedge for Satan to kill his children and everything he had. So he had faith to have children. He had faith to create wealth. But he had not established and cultivated a faith to keep his children. He had not cultivated a faith to keep his wealth. Why? Because the scripture tells us he was always speaking negatively. He was never quiet about his fears. All the troubles that used to hit his spirit, he found himself always speaking on these things. Oh, I imagine if my children die one day. Oh, I imagine if tomorrow all my wealth is gone. Oh, I imagine if this happened. I imagine if this happened. And there are people who, yes, have fear, but even worse, they're not afraid to speak about their fear. They're not afraid to speak about their fear. But yet, when they were getting the thing, when they were believing God for the thing, they believed in faith. Many people know the faith that acquires, but some do not know the faith that keeps. They don't know the faith that keeps. They don't know the faith that keeps. And because they don't know the faith that keeps, many of the stuff, some of you, you look at your personal lives and see opportunities that came your way that could have changed the trajectory of your story financially. And just one thing happened. You entered the deal. You even signed the paperwork. Probably even partial payment was made. And that was the end of it. That was the end of it. You got a job. And in your first two, three, four, five months, one year, a funny fraud happened at your workplace. You are not even a part of it. Before you know it, Politics came through your workplace. And the next thing you knew, while you had made it up there, they fired you. I know individuals that went into very stable jobs. They bought luxuries, cars and stuff like that. They borrowed monies from banks with interests because they knew that their jobs were able to sustain. And then one day they wake up and that job goes before their very own eyes. And they need to pay the bank loans. And then they don't know what to do. And then they start selling off this and selling off that. And before you know it, in two, three, four, five months, you look at the individual and they are no more. They are no more. Oh, yes, Satan came and did this. Oh, yes, Satan came and did that. Yes, for he came to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says that I am come that you might have life and life to the fullest. The Amplified says that you might have more abundance of it until it overflows. God has not intended to open a door for you that is not to completion. There are women out there who have had children and lost their own children in the womb or in birth. The Bible says that he's not the God who allows a woman to conceive and she does not bring forth child. He is not the God. By the time he planted that child in your womb, it's because he knew that that child had to carry through to full maturation into an adult who had to come out alive. But how many women have had miscarriages? 
How many women have had steel baths? How many women have lost their babies at birth? I need you to understand that scripturally, God has provided for us an answer to help you keep. And everybody at the sound of my voice, I decree in the name of Jesus Christ, that as you're hearing these things and they're entering your spirit, you shall never at any one point ascribe to do anything, attempt to do anything, and that thing is not done to completion to the glory of God, and indeed to have an end that is expected of the Lord. Because he says, I know the plans that I have for you. He says, plans to make you prosper and not to harm you said the Lord. He says, thoughts of peace are not of evil. He says, to give you an expected end. In other words, God knows your expectation. He has not put it in a man to fail. He has never ordained us to fail. It was never intended for man to fail. And because it's not intended for man to fail, he knows you have expectations. He knows you have expectations in your career. He knows you have expectations in your marriage. He knows you have expectations with your children. He knows you have expectations in your ministry. He knows you have expectations in that project. He knows you have expectations in your marriage. He knows you have expectations in the children you raise. God has not intended that your boy would die of drugs. He knows you have expectations of seeing a future of your son growing up and becoming a successful citizen, raising children as well, carrying up the family posterity from one generation to another. That is the will of God. His thoughts toward you are good, and their thoughts of peace are not evil. There are many things that happen across the world, and people say, ah, it is the Lord's will. Understand the will of God. He wills that all men be saved, not destroyed, and come to the knowledge of the truth. That is the will of God concerning your life. He says, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? That's the will of God concerning man. Mankind is supposed to have salvation. When what is salvation? Peace, tranquility, prosperity, success, divine health, joy, victory, triumph, love, and everything that represents goodness. He says, all good and perfect gifts come from God in whom there is no shadow of turning within. God has not intended to send bad to man. Oh, one man quotes scripture, shall God give us good only and not bad as well? No, you're quoting a man who was speaking. That was not the oracle of God. The Bible says if a man should speak, let him speak as the oracle of God. It's not God's mind for you to fail. Of course, there are people out there who have built doctrines around failure because they don't know the truth. They don't know the truth. In our generation right now, it's almost as though even men of God, Christians, are sorry to speak the truth. They're sorry to speak the truth because it's almost as though we have been pushed into political correctness. The Church of Jesus Christ has been pushed into the realm of thought and reason. And so if something is not thoughtful and reasonable, it's not acceptable by the world. Yes, it's okay for the world not to accept what we are saying. But it's wrong for us to compromise with the world in their ignorance. God has given us his word. And we owe him an accountability and a responsibility to tell the world the truth. Because it's this truth that makes them free. Now today, even men and women of God across the world even fear. If you ask them a question about is this sin or not. Some even fear to say it is because they fear the repercussions of men whose souls are dead and whose consciences are seared from the life of God. And now we are in times in some places of the world where it's impossible to speak about faith a certain way. It's not acceptable to speak about faith a certain way. Well, I have good news for you. There are still people who believe God in the words that he has said and we are okay to be on the wrong record of men and stay on the right side of history. We are. But we have to take God for his word to be true and every man a liar. The world is gripped by fear. Look at the superpowers in the world that have made nuclear weapons, warheads, nations that are protected by weaponry. I met one fellow who told me that in the United States they have weapons that can even crack the earth if explosion took place. How many nations have made nuclear weapons? And they are superpowers, they are great powers, their borders are guarded, okay? But a virus has shaken them. They are scared, they don't have hope. And Christians also are like that. You find Christians also scared like the world is. And yet they claim to have the life of God. 
You find Christians acting like people of the world. And yet he said that in him was life, and that is Jesus. And the life was the light of men. And he says, and that light shined in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. Darkness has no power. He said, no weapon fashioned against the children of God shall prosper. No weapon. No weapon. No weapon. No weapon. We cannot say that for the rest of humanity that does know God. But I can surely say this, that for the believer, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee, he says, in judgment thou shalt condemn. He says, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness, he says, is of me, saith the Lord. What's our heritage as Christians? What is our heritage as believers? That no weapon that is formed shall be successful over our lives. And that is why I tell parents, keep your children in faith. Keep yourselves in faith. It's okay for the world to think that we are foolish. But I believe more than ever before, everywhere there's been a manifestation of darkness, like you see COVID-19 now, there has always been an opportunity for the church of Jesus Christ and the life of God to be exalted. I believe that this is a hard season for the world and we're praying for the world. But I believe that this is a great season for the church because we now have an opportunity to turn men to the saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Presidents across the world have started now to come to the realization that we cannot do anything without prayer. Our president himself here said, we need to pray for one another. Why are they all ascribing to a power above human ability? Because they know this cannot be fixed by men. And now we who are representatives of the kingdom, we who carry that life, were the ones supposed to go to the world and tell them, look, there is healing. There is love. There is a glory of God that is bigger than what is threatening you. Oh, there is even a bigger fear than COVID. And that's the fear of dying without receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But anyway, back to the issue. The world will always have fear. The world will always have fear. But as that is happening, there is a confidence that is being built in the body of Christ every day. And that is why I tell Christians across the world, in spite of whatever is happening, have peace. Let your mind stay on God. Let your mind stay on God. That means we trust him. That means we trust him. Anyway, back to the story, to what I was trying to build here. So we see many instances of people who have begun and done things that they're not able to keep, that they're not able to finish, that they're not able to see to the end. And so there's weakness, there's shame, there's disappointment, there's scorn. Which of you uh, planning to build, uh, the Bible says, does not count the cost, whether he is able. But what is this cost? What is this counting? How do I see these things to completion? Praise God. Now, I'll give you an answer. One time when I was praying in that area, the Lord spoke to me something so fundamental. He asked me, before I teach you how to keep, you must know and understand how you are kept, he said. Before I teach you keeping faith, preserving faith, you need to know how I keep you. You need to know how I preserve you. You need to know how I maintain you. Because if you don't know how I maintain you, how will you maintain stuff? If you don't know how I keep you, how will you keep stuff? Now, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3, and I want to read from the Amplified Bible. Now, he said, Praised, honored, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He says, By his boundless mercy, listen, we have been born again to an ever-living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have been born. We have been born again to an ever-living hope. In other words, when you are born again, your hope is a life. It's a nature. It's a nature. I would have said a born-again believer should not lose hope. But scripture here in Peter says that a born-again believer cannot lose hope. Why? Because the Bible says we are born again to an ever-living hope. Through what? Through that resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What gives us hope? The resurrection of the person of Christ. When we know that death could not hold him, sickness could not hold him, destruction could not hold him, nothing could hold him. That is the confidence that makes our hope alive. I always tell people, if Jesus had died and not resurrected, Christianity would not exist. 
there will be no reason for our hope. And like Paul says in his words, we would be of all men most miserable. Imagine if Jesus did not die. <laughs> he said, imagine it. He says in Corinthians 15, he says, if we who are abiding in Christ have hope only in this life, and that is all, then we are of all people most miserable to be pitied. Why? Because if we believe that he died and rose again, yet he did not die then we have almost people miserable. We would have misery all around us. Why? Because we'll believe a God who does not work. We would not be able to stand boldly to say that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But why do we have that boldness? Because we know that Jesus Christ died. And not only did he die, we saw the resurrection of the Christ by faith. By faith. It is written and we believe the word that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. That is what separates Christianity from many of the faiths in the world. Many faiths don't even believe Jesus died. That's the real McCoy. That's the gist of the matter, that we believe that Jesus Christ died and was raised again. That resurrection is the reason why every believer has hope. By nature, it's the reason why you have hope. You could go through the worst things anybody would ever go through, but you'll go through those things as one with hope. That's the difference. That the world can have challenges, believers too can have challenges, but they have challenges without hope. Or if they have a hope, it's dead in nature because they are not regenerated in Christ. But I always tell people, if men in the world have a hope that is dead in nature, but still have the results of that hope, how much more you which is born again to an ever-living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He was raised from the dead. Your hope is alive. When the Bible says that you have ever-living hope, it means you have a reason to believe God. There is nothing in the world, there is no law by the Spirit that should fault or would fault you for believing God for anything. That's what he's saying. There is no law in the world, in heaven and under earth, that would fault you for believing God for anything. That's a livelihood. And he continues to say in the next verse, he says that we are born anew into an inheritance which is beyond the reach of change and decay. It's imperishable. He says your inheritance is beyond the reach of change and decay. It's imperishable. So you are born to an ever-living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And he says, and in your salvation also, there is an inheritance that is beyond the reach of change and decay and is imperishable. He says it's unsolid and unfading and reserved in heaven for you. It's reserved in heaven for you. It's reserved for you. So one, you have a never living hope. Two, you have an inheritance that is reserved, cannot die, cannot disappear, cannot decay, cannot perish, cannot fed. And the next verse says you, you individuals, you the believer, he says, who are being guarded, garrisoned by God's power through your faith. Till you fully, he said, inherit that final salvation that is ready to be revealed for you in the last times. What is he saying? You are being guarded or garrisoned by God's power through faith. So again, I'm telling you, but how are we kept? Because it tells me you cannot keep or you cannot see some to completion, follow me, without understanding how you are kept. And he said, you are kept by my power. This is God. You are kept by my power. But how does that power work? How does my power work to keep you? He says, through your faith. Not through the faith of Apostle Grace. Not through the faith of your teacher. Not through the faith of your evangelist. Not through the faith of your prophet. Not through the faith of your preacher. Not through the faith of your mentor. Not through the faith of your wealth. No, he says, through your faith. Now, he's giving us a very powerful key here. He's saying, Whatever will allow me to activate the power to keep you is through your faith. It's through your faith. It's through your faith. And so if it's through your faith that I work as God to activate power to keep you, if I can keep you by your faith, then you can keep anything else by your faith because you are the center of the keeping. You are the life that activates that faith. You are the dreamer that activates that faith. You are the visionary that activates that faith. You are the entity in that center that activates that faith. The same faith that you have in God to keep you. The same faith that you have in God to keep you. 
is the very right and key that allows God to activate his power to keep you. I want you to follow that firstly. That many people worry about what they cannot keep. And yet the bigger fear in this equation is they cannot even be kept by the power of God because they do not know how to live by faith. <laughs> the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. Do you know what it means? It means that regardless, regardless of what happens in your life, I don't care whether the doctor gave you a report of an incurable disease and says, you know what? This disease cannot. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. That's the spirit of a man, he says in Proverbs 18, 14. He says he will sustain his weakness. So there is nothing, nothing whatsoever, however bad it can be, that your spirit cannot sustain if you know how to build and fortify your spirit. But it has to begin with you. To believe, I tell people, that before you even believe God for the keeping of the things around you, for the completion of the things God has begun through you by faith, you must cultivate a faith, a tenacity in your spirit to believe God for the power to keep you. Firstly, because some people are killed <laughs> even in the middle of a work. I've seen people who have died way prematurely in the middle of a work. The issue in the Christian faith is not that Jesus died early. No, the issue of the Christian faith is that even though Jesus died at the age of 33, he said it is finished. He had accomplished what God had sent him out to accomplish. That is the essence. That is the essence. It doesn't matter whether Jesus had lived for 100 years on the earth but had not accomplished what God had called him to accomplish through faith, then that would be trouble. That would be trouble. For the world, because again, Christianity would not have a definition and an essence. But the reason why we celebrate the life in Christ and the church of Jesus is marching on triumphantly every other day through victory is because simply this man saw that commitment to the end. The completion was imminent. Again, begin with a faith that keeps you. You must believe God to keep you. You must believe God that you live a full life. You must believe God that you will not die until you accomplish whatever he placed on your life to do. Hallelujah. You must believe God that nothing will kill you, nothing will take you, nothing will take you out until you accomplish whatever he has ordained you in life to do. Have faith in God's power to keep you in health, in a sober mind, in the perfection of love. That's essence. And now we go to the stuff. We go to the other things, to the projects, these other things that attach themselves into our life for our comfort, for ministry, for success, for prosperity, for the end to be of the Lord, for the fulfillment of the assignment and mandate concerning our lives. I tell people that I have understood, for example, if you are feeling pain in your body, okay, and you start confessing, uh, he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him, and by his stripes I was healed. The life of God is in me. I was healed. The life of God is in me. This is me telling me. The life of God is in me. I was healed. The life of God is in me. And I continue to speak that until I can believe my words. Okay? For the Bible says, He shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. The Bible says, He shall have whatsoever he saith. If I continue confessing that, Okay? My body gets in line. My body is aligned. And that's how I'm kept. You're not healthy because you don't have a disease in your body. No. There are people who have signs of diseases in their body or perhaps even in their own blood and are going to live a full life. And there are individuals who don't have a trace of sickness in their body and are going to die tomorrow morning or next week or next year for some other reason. Okay? Get that very faith in God to keep you by his power and extend it to the things that touch your life, to the things that connect to your life. Why would you believe God for that kind of divine health and tomorrow your business fails in shutters, a project crashes in the middle and you easily draw back, you easily give up? Firstly, 
it's an error for you to even recognize failure. Because Jesus said, we are not of them that draw back to perdition. We are not of them that draw back into perdition. He says, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. In other words, we believe until the answer comes. What if it does not come today? You still believe. What if it does not come tomorrow? You still believe. What if it does not come next week? You still believe. What if you're out of time? You still believe. What if it is too late? You still believe. And that's the beholding of the end that gives the man of God the confirmation that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. You will look at your personal lives and all of us might have seen areas in life that did not go our way. But that does not mean that we don't have victory. The word of God is still true today as it was yesterday as it shall be tomorrow. But the people who through one failure, one mishap in life, they can draw something around them that will kill everything that will come in their lives. You are kept by the power of God. That same power that keeps you is the same power that extends on everything that touches you. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, which is the author and the finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The author and finisher of our faith. In other words, the day you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that was all you needed for the measure you'd need to do anything in this world. You're a believer. When you believe Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the day you said, I receive you as my Lord and Savior, you left darkness and entered the marvelous light. You left loss and entered gain and profit. You left death and entered life. The day you received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, from that day, everything touching your life changed. Why? Because you're a partaker of a divine nature, the Bible says that you partook of all the promises and inheritances in God. Everything he promised, his own, you have received. In Peter he says, whereby is given unto us exceeding great precious promises. That by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. Why do you carry a divine nature? Why do you carry a divine seed in you? That you might show forth the praises of him that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You were born for success. You were born for glory. You were born. You were born to show forth. That's who you are. That's what you were born for. You were never born to fail. It has never been in the mind of God for you to fail. I always tell people, even if I try to fail, I can't fail. Even if I make up my mind to fail, I can't fail. And somebody says, how can you say that even if you try to fail, you can't fail? Yet there are people who are failing even without trying directly. I tell them, because I'm speaking of my nature. I'm conscious of the nature of me than anything else that I see outside. And I speak those things as Philemon 1, 6 says that the communication of your faith will become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you, which is in Christ Jesus. You must learn to acknowledge every good thing which is in you. You don't need to feel sick to start confessing divine health. Even when you're healthy from head to toe, it doesn't hurt to say, I have the life of God in me. I have the life of God in me. God is inside me. He's in my beings. He's in my body. He's in my muscle. He's in my blood. He's in my system. He's everywhere. It, it doesn't harm to do that. No. Every time you learn to acknowledge every good thing which is in you, which is in Christ, you keep your faith effective. I wish somebody got that. You keep your faith effective. So what if the project did not work? Acknowledge what is good in you in Christ. I cannot fail. I'm not of them that draw back to perdition. I'm of them that believe to the saving of the soul. And what if it happens the next day? Communicate that good thing which is in you, which is in Christ. There's something in you. It's the word of God inside you. He abides in you permanently through faith. That's Jesus Christ. This is so hard for many people to understand that. I tell people, we don't confess negatively because we don't want to see negative stuff happen. 
That's how the world would teach you. Christianity, born again believers, we don't confess negatively because it's not in our nature to confess negatively. Oh, so what if I confess negatively? Then that is your carnal flesh speaking, not your spirit. Your spirit man is not against God. No. The Bible says that the flesh lasted against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. In other words, these two things are never together. No, 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 no. One is always against the other. One is subject to the law of God, and the other one cannot be. The flesh cannot be subject to the law of God. Understand that. So when you say, oh, I think this has failed, this is not you. It is your carnal man confessing failure. It's not in your nature. It's not in your DNA to fail. You cannot fail. I always tell people, learn to confess your nature. If it means getting scriptures in the Bible that touch your nature and you learn to speak, because today, even the world has learned to confess. If you go in New Age uh, teachings, they have learned to confess right. They have learned to speak to possess. But what's the difference between what they are confessing and the believer's confession? This is the difference. You confess of a nature. They confess of elements. They are confessing of elements. They are confessing of their mind. But you confess of a nature. The fallen nature of man is fallen. So he can fail and fall. The wisdom of this world, he said, it's brought to nothing. They are doomed to pass away. So if the sons of men in their own wisdom have exercised enough grace to give them right to preserve things, but which things have an end in them. How much more you, which is a child of God? He says that for you, your communication is supposed to begin with your nature in God. You must learn and appreciate who you are. Yes, things will go differently. Yes, things will hit you. A lady uh, sent me a message a couple of days ago. And they were taking her to theater for operation. And she sent me a message and said, but even while they were taking me through the theater for operation, I was tapping the doctors, telling them, hey, doctors, I'm not sick. Hey, doctors, I cannot be sick. Hey, doctors, I don't fall sick. Doctors, do you know I don't fall sick? Can I teach you about that God who preserves our body? She spoke to the end. That's a believer. That's a believer. That's a believer. That's a believer. Even better, you can even speak yourself <laughs> out of an operation. So what I'm trying to tell us here, God told me that the answer was in us learning to meditate and speak, touching our nature. Who are you? Because the world invests so much in doing and earning, but it has not established the pattern of being. Because every time they go in the being, they are human beings. They are homo sapiens. We are more than human beings. He says, if any man be in Christ, if any Man being Christ. The Bible says that man is a new creation. And it says, behold, the old is past and now the new. And it says, and all things are of God. They are of God. There's a woman whose marriage is failing now. Maybe you've been confessing even negatively over your life. Or perhaps, yes, you've been confessing, but not toward your nature. Every good thing which is in you, which is in Christ. Learn to speak the words of God. Learn, bring the word of God into your marriage and say, whosoever the Lord has joined, let no man put asunder. Not even my husband is able to put us asunder. You learn to confess. You learn to speak every good thing which is in you, which is in Christ. I have seen a glory even in prayer when I learn to confess my nature. It's a nature issue. It's a nature issue. I wish people understand it. It's a nature issue. If somebody searched me in my head and looked through my whole brain, there is no consciousness to fail. And not because the things of this world are trustable or that the things of this world are predictable. But even in the most unpredictable sense, God has cast lots for my nature. He has spoken who you are in him. He has said that I have blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He's saying that he has given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. Through the epignosis, through the complete and advanced knowledge, for that knowledge 
to establish fully manifestation, you must understand that it carries a certain completion. It's not the progression of that knowledge that gives the guarantee. It's the knowledge that that knowledge in you is complete, epignosis, the complete, the precise, and perfect knowledge of God in us. And how is epignosis realized in our spirits? Through faith. You must understand that even the realm of knowledge is a realm of faith. I'm talking about just the knowledge that is progressive. No, I'm talking about the knowledge that is complete and perfect in God. Why? Because the Bible says that she are complete in him, which is the head of all principality. So if the Bible says that she are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, how then can you worry of your completion in knowledge in him? Epignosis is not a place we go to. Epignosis is a place we awaken to. Epignosis is not a place we visit by reason of exercising. Epignosis is a place we belong by understanding of our nature. Christ is in you, the hope of glory. This is the mystery that was hid from the ages past and now revealed. It is the mystery. It is the mystery. It is the mystery. It is the mystery. Now, because of that, I tell people, firstly, believe that you have Jesus in your life. Secondly, believe that he is for you and not against you because his word has spoken. He knows the plans that he has toward you. His word is ever steadfast and it never fails. Believe of the nature that you've obtained in Christ and understand that the way you are as a believer is always going to be different from the way the world is for men who have not believed God. And because of that, you exercise yourself and apply yourself every other day for that confession, for that proclamation, for that profession for that experience in your heart or is to tell yourself I cannot fail this cannot fail my project cannot fail my marriage cannot fail my business cannot fail my relationships cannot fail my career cannot fail my ministry cannot fail what if it goes out I still believe I still believe I still believe because the God you believed raised Jesus from the dead that was the hardest thing human beings ever saw, to get Jesus from the dead. Because Jesus was not just any other dead man. This is the man that carried the sins of the world. He was the man that became sin and carried our iniquities. And that's the Jesus I want to give you tonight. And so if you've heard that word, I want to pray with you right now. Because I believe God wants to do something through the word that has been spoken tonight. For those of you, if you are there and you say, you know, I got to a place in life where I had built or started a project by faith and somehow in the middle I failed, now you know why you failed. I believed God for health and I was walking right and then before I knew that, again, my body has started to go under and it's undergoing a downward spiral. Now you know what to do. You've received understanding. Oh, I started a ministry, it was a success for a couple of days and weeks, and then that ministry failed, now you know what to do. Oh, I had a problem, I started my marriage well, and now it's failing, now you know what to do. I raised my son right, my daughter right, and now she's in drugs and given herself over to deception and death, now you know what to do. Who are you? That's the question. Who are you? And wherever you are right now, I want to pray with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, because your word has been sent and the essence of that word was to reactivate anything that had died, anything that had given way, anything that had started to fail, anything that had started to falter, anything that had gone out of line, anything that had lost hope, anybody that had given up, anybody that had given in. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that may God minister to you right now. I speak to all the projects that had died in your life to get life again in the name of Jesus. I speak to somebody's marriage that was dying and on the rocks to receive life in the name of Jesus. I speak health in the name of Jesus for somebody whose body is failing. God is healing you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray for a minister who is frustrated whose heart is failing, 
because of the deadness of their ministry. They no longer see life in their ministry. Maybe there was a time they saw those chairs empty and their hearts drew back to perdition. I speak life to your ministry in the name of Jesus Christ. I speak life to that person's education. There's somebody who went out of school, you failed to get fees. And then you gave up. God did not give you that opportunity to go to school so not to complete. He is a God of completion because as himself, he is complete and he must complete. And so I speak for a breakthrough for your finances in the name of Jesus. That you go to school and finish. And finish. And finish. Some of you have buildings that have failed to complete. Some of you have projects that have stalled. You are given promises. And those projects have stalled. And you almost gave up on those projects. I release a life that moves them and sees them to accomplishment. In Jesus' name, I've prayed and believed. Amen. Amen. If you have made that prayer with me, God has heard. And I believe and declare, because of who you are in God, that whatever has been frustrating you in the name of Jesus, the power of God through the word, has come to start that thing again to move and throw you to your next level of success. I am persuaded that I'm a success. I am persuaded that my ministry is a success. I am persuaded that my marriage is a success. I am persuaded that my children are a success, both spiritual and physical. I am persuaded that I cannot fail. When you learn that, you'll know the difference between people who simply talk, they blab, but they don't have the strength of the spirit to see the manifestations of the things that they speak. And sometimes it's more than just speaking. It's the authority of the word spoken in a man's spirit that is established in this reality of the nature. Christians fail only because of nature. But now that you know the truth, the truth makes you free. And if there's anybody out there and you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to receive him as your Lord and Savior. And if you're there, you simply reply these words with me. You say, Jesus, I have heard your word and I believe that you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. Today, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest. Thank you.